If you were to ask me what my favorite video game series of all time is, I would not hesitate to say The Legend of Zelda. I remember as clear as day when I was first introduced to the series from watching the Super Mario Bros. Super Show, and then later watching my cousins playing Twilight Princess and asking them what the hell they were playing because it really caught my eye. Then for my birthday in 2011, I got a Nintendo DSi and my first Zelda game, The Legend of Zelda Spirit Tracks, which took me around a year and a half to beat. And then five months later, I got my second Zelda game, which is what really made me a fan of the series. That game being The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword, a game that is both loved by some Zelda fans and hated by many others. And I'm one of the few people who really like this game, and I feel like it has way too much of a bad reputation among other Zelda fans. Not only was this the first Zelda game I ever beat, but I even beat it to 100% on Hero Mode twice. And I've always wanted to make a video about why I don't think this game is as bad as everyone says it is. And with Skyward Sword HD right around the corner, I'll be sure to give a list of what I think can be improved. Now, before all the people who hate Skyward Sword come attack me for liking it, just know that I'm not trying to change anyone's opinion of this game because, simply put, I can't. Can't believe I'm saying that now since it should be common sense at this point. Now, unlike my Spectros video, I'm going to be diving headfirst with the spoilers, so consider this your spoiler warning if you haven't played and beaten Skyward Sword yet. Okay, now that they're gone, hopefully, I'm going to be going over why I think Skyward Sword is an underrated gem in my eyes, and how I fix a lot of the issues that people seem to complain about. You've probably seen how long this video is, so I won't waste any more time and get right into it. If there's one thing that I'm sure most people can agree on, it's that Skyward Sword's story is fucking awesome. In fact, I think Skyward Sword's story is the best story that has ever been told in a Zelda game. And what really makes it for me are the characters, because they're all super expressive and don't feel like planks of wood, especially Link and Zelda. I just love how expressive Link is and how he projects a wide variety of emotions to the player. It definitely does a way better job than Twilight Princess, and even Breath of the Wild in my opinion. Zelda is without a doubt the best she's been in any other game, and I also really like how they establish her and Link as childhood friends because it makes it so that you actually want to save her instead of just being told to with no real reason other than for the sake of the plot. Groose is a big bully who has a huge crush on Zelda, and it's pretty funny at times, but he has some amazing character development throughout the game because he matures a lot. Impa is just... old. Girahim I fucking love as a villain because he's very unique and actually somewhat intimidating. In fact, I remember actually being scared shitless when I first encountered him in the Skyview Temple. I was seven years old. I don't remember the exact time, but all I know is that it was night and I still had the lights off in my living room. I opened the boss door, and the whole cutscene had me shaking, probably because of how evil Girahim's theme is. But then came the actual boss fight, and as the music kicked in, my legs had turned to jelly. I tried to swing my sword, but he caught it and then stole it from me. And that's when I yelled, dropped the Wii remote, ran out into the dining room, ran back in quickly to restart the Wii, and then immediately swapped the Skyward Sword disc for LEGO Star Wars. I don't think I picked up the game for about two weeks after that. But yeah, all these years later, I realized that Girahim is an amazing antagonist with his Joker-like attitude. And then there's Fi, who I actually didn't have an issue with like many other people. She's introduced very early on as a servant of the goddess who lives in the Master Sword and that she's merely serving her purpose of guiding Link. She's very robotic and lifeless for most of the game and loves to give you information and play Captain Obvious. Oftentimes, you can simply ignore it by just not pressing the down button, but a lot of it is also unavoidable, especially when you've just received an item after beating a mini-boss since she just repeats the same thing over and over again. And that's a fair point to make. I personally didn't mind it because I would casually spam the A button during Fi's dialogue, but I can understand why it annoys people. However, towards the end of the game, Fi reveals more of a human side, and in the ending cutscene, she tells Link that she enjoyed their time together and that she was able to experience a little bit of happiness. And that farewell from Five really hit me, and probably even the people who wanted to throw their Wii Remote at the TV because of her. But it's also very heartwarming because you'll know that she'll always accompany Link in other games. In fact, you can even hear her in Breath of the Wild after beating the Trial of the Sword DLC. Like many others, I like to divide Skyward Sword's story into different arcs. The opening, the exploration arc where you follow Zelda's trail through each region, the flame arc where you go through each region again to complete some stressful and horrifying trials to collect the sacred flames to power your sword and turn it into the almighty master sword, the dragon arc where you go through each region for a third time and learn each section of the Song of the Hero, and then the final arc where you finally claim the Triforce, send the goddess statue back to the surface, and then rescue Zelda and defeat Demise in the past. 
And while everyone seems to love this story, a lot of people don't really like the pacing of it because its opening is apparently too long and too stupid! Yeah, like Twilight Princess, which is usually more praised among fans than Skyward Sword. In fact, I think that Twilight Princess's opening is even longer than Skyward Sword's because in Twilight Princess, you have to do a bunch of useless bullshit like herding goats twice. Retrieving a cradle that got stolen from a bird, fishing for a cat, saving a dumbass kid and the monkey he was chasing after being forced to show off your skills with a slingshot and a sword, wrestle some cattle, give up your sword to the dumbass kid, and then the game actually begins. And by the way, all of that is mandatory and that is stupid. In Skyward Sword, rescuing the cat on top of the Night Academy is optional. And so is practicing with the sword in the training hall before going into a cave to rescue your Loftwing. All of which can be finished a lot sooner than in Twilight Princess. Not trying to say it's a bad game by any means, but I think it's a bit stupid that people are complaining about Skyward Sword's opening when they should really be complaining about Twilight Princess's. But another complaint I hear relating to the pacing is how the surface feels very linear and that there's a lot of backtracking involved and how you always have to be going back and forth in between the sky if you want to go anywhere else. And that I can definitely understand. The sky is a giant wasteland that is so boring to look at and to travel through that it feels a lot like a chore you just want to try to avoid. But that can also be said for Ocarina of Time and Twilight Princess's Hyrule Field. Ocarina's Hyrule Field is absolutely boring and empty to walk through as a kid that you're better off just doing a bunch of side jumps if you even want to go anywhere during the first half of the game. And not to mention you'll be hearing this over and over again. As for Twilight Princess, Hyrule Field is massive and there's barely anything either other than just some enemies that can be defeated by just jerking the Wii Remote around. I mean, at least you get Epona back early on so it makes traveling through Hyrule without fast travel enjoyable, and the views are nice to look at compared to the sky. And going through each region three times does get repetitive towards the end, but I do appreciate the game introducing new areas of that region or at least trying to do something to change it up like flooding Theron Woods and Elton Volcano erupting. Although there's two things in this game's story that I can't see anyone enjoying. The quest where you have to go back to the end of the Skyview Temple just to gather sacred water for Faron the Water Dragon, or having to escort Scrapper up the fucking volcano when you could've just landed at the bird statue right in front of the fire sanctuary and saved the player about 20 minutes. And then of course, there's the Imprisoned, aka Demise as a Dinosaur and the boss that everyone loathes. You have to fight this motherfucker a total of three times, and you'll have to fight him even more if you want to get the Hylian Shield, which I strongly recommend by the way. Each fight is, well, barely different from one another. The first time, he's just a walking giant with no arms and you have to stop him with just your sword. The second time, he grows a pair of arms so he's able to climb, and you have help from Groos and his Groosinator, which you can switch to Groos and launch giant bombs at him. Not that they really do much other than prevent him from moving for a few seconds. And then the third time... is... <sighs> it's just ridiculous. This time, he has a tail, and he can fly. Thankfully, it's a lot shorter, but... just... why a third time? I mean, you also have to fight Girahim three times, but at least the new additions make each boss fight more interesting. At first, Girahim is a piece of cake in the Skyview Temple. Then in the Fire Sanctuary, he's got two swords and a new variety of attacks once you get to his second phase. And then in the past, he's got three phases by knocking him off of a platform, playing some evil tennis, and then destroying his evil axe by swinging your sword in the right direction. Now the first two imprisoned fights make sense since they're right before and after you've powered your sword up with the sacred flames, but with a third fight, depending on which order you decide to meet with the three dragons, it feels like it's almost immediately after running an errand in the sky. And while I'm patient enough to fight it a third time, I can see why others would just dread it. But you know what? Let's discuss one of my favorite cutscenes from the game instead, the Lincoln Zelda reunion, which is kind of the transition cutscene between the sacred flame arc and the dragon arc. It has some beautiful dialogue and my favorite rendition of Zelda's lullaby, but it's just one of the many moments that makes me love Skyward Sword's story more than any other Zelda game. Zelda tells Link her destiny as the goddess Hylia reborn, and Link as the goddess's chosen hero. And since Zelda feels bad for putting Link through all of this, she tells Link that she'll seal herself for thousands of years until Link is able to claim the Triforce and seal away demise forever. Link then rushes to try and stop her as he's pounding on the seal while Zelda tells him that while she's still the goddess Hylia reincarnated, she's still her father's daughter and his friend. She even asks him if he'll come to wake her up once it's all over. And then, as Zelda enters her deep sleep, Link hangs his head in defeat and even starts crying off screen knowing that his friend is stuck in the past. 
And let me remind you that this is often regarded as one of the worst Zelda games by hardcore fans. <sighs> oh, sorry, I got carried away by the music. Just like this story, Skyward Sword has probably the best soundtrack out of any other Zelda game. In fact, it may very well be my favorite soundtrack to a video game ever. Now, Zelda has always been top tier when it comes to music, but here it just feels like they went even higher. They decided to go with a fully fledged orchestra, and it sounds beautiful. And whether you're a Zelda fan or just a fan of music in general, I highly recommend listening to the soundtrack sometime. Also, I don't know if anyone else's copy came with the 25th Anniversary Orchestra CD. Mine's unfortunately got a bunch of scratches on it, so I can barely play anything. But I remember listening to this all the time. My favorite was always track 7 because it feels like a gradual build-up and then explodes into the main theme, and it always gives me an instant eargasm. And if you want to listen to it sometime, I'm sure there's rips of the CD that you can find here on YouTube. Just type Zelda 25th Anniversary CD and it should be one of the first results. Alright, I know that not everyone is a fan of the motion controls, but still, the idea behind the motion controls I think are pretty cool. Being able to actually use your Wii Remote as a sword and your nunchuck as a shield really immerses you. And it is super satisfying to hear the noise your shield makes after you successfully counter an attack. Plus, the game takes advantage of the fact that you can now swing your sword in multiple directions, so you have to swing it in the right direction in order to kill enemies like Dekubabas, Bokoblins, and Stalfos. And I think I speak on behalf of many people who had no issues with the motion controls. Like, I don't think I had to recalibrate my Wii Remote more than five times during a whole playthrough. Everything I did felt very precise, and whenever I messed up, 99% of the time I knew it was my fault and not the game's fault. Also, this game was the first Zelda game to include a run button and a stamina meter, which would later be used in Breath of the Wild, and a hero mode, which you unlock after beating the game, but I'm sure you already knew that if you've already played and beaten Skyward Sword. It's basically Skyward Sword, but without any heart drops, meaning hearts are nowhere to be found, so you have to primarily rely on potions or sitting down on a stool or a bench to regenerate hearts. That is, unless you cheese it by collecting the heart medallion and enemies and bosses are slightly harder. It also gives you a faster Skyward Strike as soon as you first pull out the Goddess Sword, so by the time it becomes the true Master Sword, whenever you want to charge up a Skyward Strike, you just hold the Wii Remote up and BAM! Now you can get the Hylian Shield a bit quicker. But besides that, Skyward Sword has plenty of strengths other than just the story and the soundtrack. The item upgrade system is extremely useful for both small treasures and for combat up until if you decide to get the Hylian Shield from Lenny Roo's boss rush. Rupin's Night Market, where you can sell those treasures for a decent amount of rupees, is also very useful. There's even a Gossip Stone in the cave in Skyloft that will sell you rare treasures so you can use them for upgrading your items or selling them for rupees, which doesn't really make a lot of sense to buy them just to sell them, but carrying on. I also think that one of Skyward Sword's biggest strengths are the dungeons, because all of the dungeons, minus the Earth Temple, are pretty good. I really like how atmospheric and ominous they feel, and how each of them have something that makes them unique from one another. Like the time shift stones in the Lenore Mining Facility being used to switch between the present and the past in order to solve certain puzzles or to get certain items, and having to organize the Sky Keep in order to gain each piece of the Triforce. Now, if you're wondering why I didn't say the Earth Temple was pretty good, I just find it to be the least interesting thematically. I'm not a huge fan of the music that plays. The boss is kind of boring, in fact, I'd go as far as to say that it's ridiculously easy. And I think it's the most simple out of all the other dungeons in the game in terms of puzzles. My favorites, however, would have to be the Ancient Cistern and the Sanja, because I love the concept surrounding both of them. In the Ancient Cistern, you're welcomed into this beautiful, botanic-like dungeon with a giant statue in the middle that you can raise and lower from flipping some switches. But underneath is basically an underworld with toxic water and a slowed-down version of the surface's music filled with undead bokoblins that can't be killed unless you use a fatal blow. And there's even a point where the undead bokoblins try to follow you up a string, which is actually a reference to a Japanese folklore by... I'm not gonna try and pronounce that name, called the Spider's Thread, in which a criminal named Kandata is sent to hell for his sins, but is offered a chance by the Buddha to climb a spider's thread because the one good thing he did in his life was spare the life of a spider. He climbs the thread, but is followed by everyone else in hell, so he starts trying to shake everyone off of the thread, which causes it to rip, and Kandata falls back into hell because of his selfishness. However, even after shaking off the Bokoblins, Link makes it out alive. Oh yeah, and this dungeon's boss kicks ass. Best boss in the game by far. Because you can use his own weapons against him in the second phase and FUCKING CRUSH THAT MOTHERFUCKER! And with the sand ship, you're on an old insect-infested ship which belonged to a robot named Skipper who you meet once you first arrive at the sand sea. 
And you can shoot the time shift stone at the top of the mast to switch between the present and the past like in the Millennium Reminding Facility. Both the mini boss and the main boss kick ass too. I don't care what anyone says about how stupid the main boss looks, it's fucking awesome because you get to fight your way through the ship as it's sinking, and by the time you've gotten there the ship is torn in half, it's storming, and you're fighting what looks like if Mike Wazowski and Cecilia had a giant baby. And speaking of bosses, there's even one that you can fight inside the Thunderhead on your loft wing. I love that fight and I seriously wish it was in Lenaver's boss rush mode but for some reason it isn't. And now this might not affect casual Zelda players, but as someone who loves The Legend of Zelda and has played and beat nearly every Zelda game to 100% completion, I gotta say that a lot of the side quests were very... unique. Now they definitely aren't Majora's Mask side quests, but I found some of them to be pretty funny and others were rather odd. Probably because most, if not all of them, take place in the sky. Just to name a few, there's a guy named Batro who lives underneath Skyloft that has been transformed into a monster somehow. And the only way you can turn him back into a human is by collecting these things called Gratitude Crystals. Basically this game's version of the Golden Skulltalos from Ocarina of Time and the Pole Souls from Twilight Princess. Except the way you get the Gratitude Crystals is way easier. Just do a side quest that involves helping someone, and once you've completed them, you'll earn a certain amount of Gratitude Crystals. Like cleaning someone's house with the Gust Bellows because apparently they're too lazy to do it themselves, retrieving a pinwheel for a clown that fell into Leneru Desert, finding a replacement crystal ball for the fortune teller, Retrieving a baby rattle from a bird's nest on top of a windmill. And there's even a couple side quests with different endings. Like delivering a letter for Colin because he has a huge crush on the girl at the Night Academy. Or helping a shopkeeper at the bazaar with her love troubles. And then once you've collected all 80 gratitude crystals, you get the biggest wallet in the game. And you get to see Batro become a human, which really doesn't look any better from when he didn't look like one. But after that, you can visit him in the bazaar just enjoying not looking like a monster anymore. If only he was as handsome as Giovanni. Although the fact that there aren't any side quests on the surface feels like a huge waste of opportunity because the only things that the surface has are the goddess cubes, a couple mini games that get old quickly, and... Oh damn, that's about it besides the main story. There's also not any shops or villages on the surface, which I also think is a big waste of opportunity because it can make the surface a lot more interesting. Like, I understand that this is the first game in the Zelda timeline, but do you really have to make the surface feel so bland? Areas like Lake Floria and the Lanayru Sansi I feel like could have been used for a couple of fun minigames that could reward you with heart pieces or item upgrades so you won't have to go through the trouble of finding all the treasures to do so. Like there's so much potential for the surface and it kills me that there's barely anything to do other than the main story. Well, now you've reached the part of the video where I'm going to be going over how I'd fix Skyward Sword because I know a lot of people didn't like it that much and I have plenty of ways on how I'd try to make it better. Alright, I have a lot of things that I'd fix in this game to make it better for those who didn't really like it as much as I did. I know that there's going to be an option for analog controls instead of motion controls for Skyward Sword HD so that everyone will finally shut the hell up about them, and I'm confident that almost none of my solutions will be used in Skyward Sword HD, but just try to keep up with me, alright? The first thing that everyone complains about the most, other than the motion controls, is how linear the surface feels and how you always have to go back into the sky if you want to travel to a different region or use the Grusinator. Well guess what, I have two possible solutions to that. I'm sure I'm not the only one who's thought of these, but here's a map of the entire world, right? Well, what if the surface looked more like this with each region connecting with one another after you've beaten a temple? I think it would be very useful, and if you wanted to unlock each pathway, you could use whatever item you received in that temple to unlock it. Like for example, you get the gust bellows in the Lanayru mining facility to blow away piles of sand, so why not set up giant piles of sand that are blocking the path between the Lanayru mine and the sealed grounds? or using the beetle to activate a crystal switch blocking the path from Elden Volcano in Faron Woods, and blowing up a pile of rocks revealing a path from Lenebu Desert to Elden Volcano with some bombs. Also, I've never heard anyone bring this up, but the Goddess Harp! It really doesn't do anything except open the trial gates using the songs you learn from the Isle of Songs. Well, you know how every instrument you've used in previous Zelda games gives you some sort of fast travel? Well... How about using the Goddess Harp to fast travel to a specific bird statue using the songs that you learned from the Isle of Songs? Oh, well, how would you play the songs? I was just getting to that, so calm the fuck down. Playing them could be a combination of the nunchuck stick and the A and B buttons while strumming the Wii Remote. Or the Switch version can implement the C buttons on the left Joy-Con like in Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask. And now for some other nitpicks that I think can make the surface a bit more interesting. In every Zelda game, you've been able to blow up walls and find some kind of treasure behind it, whether it be a large sum of rupees or a piece of heart. In Skyward Sword, however, 
Those caves are almost non-existent because the only cave area in the game is on Skyloft and that's for rescuing your loftwing at the beginning of the game. And in that cave there's only a couple small chests containing 20 rupees. What I do is add some actual cave areas to each region of the surface with some silver or gold rupees, or pieces of heart in those caves after defeating some enemies and not just hide 20 rupees or a small treasure behind a bombable wall. Speaking of enemies, the fact that most of these enemies are primarily reskins of Deku Babas, Bokoblas, and Choo Choo's makes the enemy variety stale and boring. Sure, you've got some unique enemies like the Lightning Crabs in the Lanayru Desert and the Lozalthos in Elven Volcano, but that's really about it. Maybe even add some villages for the Kiwis, Magmas, Robots, and Perella because not only will they add some interesting side quests, but I think it'll make each region a bit more exciting. And if there are beds, then that means you can experience the surface at night! Something I've always wanted to do in this game because it opens up so many opportunities for different enemies and side quests. Lastly, am I the only one who thought the Lanayru Sansi had so much potential? I mean, it's called the fucking Sansi, yet the map makes it look more like a giant stream. Sure, there's a limited space on the world map, but they could have added some small islands or shops or minigames to make something out of it, kind of like Wind Waker. The same can be applied for Lake Floria because right when you dive off the platform, you land in a gigantic lake that could have been filled to the brim with treasures and maybe even a fishing minigame. But of course, the current has to immediately sweep you away. But there's also potential for a minigame where you could race one of the Perella like how you'd race the beavers as a Zora in Majora's Mask. And just like I suggested earlier, those rewards could be pieces of heart or even item upgrades. Maybe even add a couple cave areas behind those giant waterfalls. I mean, the possibilities are endless. Alright, I know a lot of people really hate the Imprisoned because of how boring and repetitive he is. Well, I was thinking of cutting it down into two fights because I can understand fighting him before and after you've gotten the Sacred Flames and went through three dungeons. But definitely not right after you've started the Dragon Arc, which is right after the Reunion cutscene, a quick trip to Skyloft, the Thunderhead, and then depending on which order you decide to meet with the dragons, you fight the Imprisoned again. But what I'd do is I'd still keep him with no arms during the first fight, and then in the second fight he has arms and he's able to fly. Plus you have the Grucinator, and the same thing that happens during the third fight will happen here instead, so that'll be the last time you have to fight him. It might also make getting the Hylian Shield a bit easier since you won't have to fight him several times again. Next is the Sky. While it doesn't bother me as much as the first half of Ocarina of Time, I can definitely see why people hate it. It's a giant wasteland that's very boring to look at, and the music really shouldn't be that epic for such a bland overworld. Most of these small islands are used to hide the goddess cube chests, but once you've found them all, there's no other reason to spend your time up there. And there's only five notable islands in the sky. Obviously you've got Skyloft, then the Lumpy Pumpkin, Bamboo Island, Beetles Island, Dodo's High Dive, and Bughaven inside the Thunderhead. Most of which are only just there for mini games. Now what I'd do to make the sky a bit more interesting is change the look of it entirely, and definitely add some more islands that are bigger and have some people's shops on there. Maybe even have Beetle flying around the sky above those islands and not just Skyloft like how in Wind Waker you can visit Beetle's shop at certain locations all throughout the Great Sea. I know there's a lot more that people would like to take out of the game to make the pacing better, but I really only have two annoyances which I already mentioned earlier. The Sacred Water and the Escort Mission. They serve no real purpose other than to just waste your time and possibly make you want to throw your Wii Remote through the TV. And even if they keep the sacred water quest, at least give the player an actual way of fast traveling like with the solution I mentioned earlier. Like is it really that hard to maybe put those songs you learned at the Isle of Songs to use and not just show them in the pause menu? And while this quest doesn't bother me, I'd probably change up the Tatones quest to something different like defeating a few underwater mini-bosses. Just seems like it would appeal to more people. And lastly for Fi. I'd just tone her down a bit and make sure she doesn't act like Captain Obvious all the time because already describing how to use an item right after the game told you how to use it immediately after getting it from the chest is just ridiculous. At the end of the day, I still love Skyward Sword and it still remains right underneath the S tier for me, although a lot of that tier list has been changed throughout the past two years. It's a game that I have very fond memories with and I'm very excited for the Switch version that's coming out on July 16th. My favorite Zelda game and favorite game of all time, however, is and will always be Majora's Mask, but if Skyward Sword had applied all that I had just said that could be used to fix many of the problems with it, there's no doubt that it would top Majora's Mask for me. And I guess the saying of the more you love something, the more flaws you can point out is real. And in this case, it's with me and Skyward Sword. And even if Skyward Sword HD doesn't fix anything other than the motion controls that they teased during the Nintendo Direct earlier this year, I'll still be more than satisfied with being able to play Skyward Sword on the go. If you somehow made it all the way through, and if you played Skyward Sword years ago and weren't a fan of it, 
Feel free to let me know why you didn't enjoy it in the comments and maybe even how you'd fix things because I'm very curious. And if you're a huge fan of this game like me, also feel free to let me know why in the comments. Now if I somehow convinced you to play through Skyward Sword again and you didn't enjoy it during your first playthrough, I'd say give it another chance and maybe even pick up the Switch version if you end up enjoying it. So that'll be all for now. Thanks for watching and I'll see you whenever I'm done fixing my Wii's optical drive because it randomly stopped working and now my sanity has gone down the drain at the fact that I can't play the 50 Wii games I have lying around in my living room anymore. See ya!